Go ahead, pledge. Do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Invocation. God, we humbly serve you today. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and remain present throughout this meeting. As our words and thoughts with holiness, that we may be instruments of your grace. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Go ahead and call the uh, workshop to order. Uh, Chairman Director, first item on your workshop is a review of fiscal year 2020 financial statement and independent auditors report for the Hidalgo County Regional Ability Authority. Uh, we should have Mr. Uh, Ricky Longoria with Bert McCumber and Longoria on uh, the line to, uh, to give the uh, report. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Mr. Deanda. Uh, can you all hear hey, me? Rick. Okay. How y'all doing? Uh, doing well, thank you. Thanks for allowing us to be here today. Uh, I also have with me Luis Lopez, who's also the who was an audit manager involved with with the actual completion of the audit. Uh, I'll 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 start by saying this, and I may have said this last year, and I say it because things haven't really changed in this regard. <laughs> in this regard, in that if you were accustomed to to uh, if, if if the presentation of an audit report seemed boring to you live, it does not get any better via video. We've tried. <laughs> everything we can to make it exciting and we just we just can't we're not that creative uh, but certainly we'll, uh, we'll we'll try to do the best we can uh, I'm going to go ahead and start off not on the auto report itself uh, I am going to start on a two-page letter called the governance letter um, I don't know if you have it in your packet packet if you don't have, have it in your packet my intent is not to read out loud the letter to you but just to speak to the salient points within the letter and then, uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to, to Mr. Lopez to go over the auto report itself. Um, with that said, with, with respect to the governance letter, uh, the purpose of this letter is just to convey certain things uh, regarding the audit that we feel is important for the board to know. It, it is a professionally required letter. Uh, it speaks to confirmation of the year being audited being December 31st, 2020. It speaks to the standards for which we, were, we conducted the audit. In this case, because you are some local government unit, we also applied government auditing standards. Um, also acknowledging that the footnotes to these financial statements or any other financial statements that you were able to read are, are an integral part of the audit report itself. I know some folks uh, like going straight to the bottom line, and I'm kind of one of those folks too. Uh, but at some point, you know, we do need to read, the, read those footnotes in order to understand the audit report in its entirety. Uh, also acknowledging the fact that that any financial statement uh, associated with an audit report, acknowledging that there are estimates in this preparation, uh, certainly in Newall's case at this point, uh, in the life of the, of the, of the RMA, uh, you know, the biggest estimate is trying to determine whether an estimate for allowance for bad debt is even necessary. Certainly, if you can imagine, uh, once you, once the, the different segments of the projects are completed and, and those costs are then then depreciable costs. Now there is an estimate with respect to the the, the life of those assets and the, and the related depreciation expense. Certainly we're not there yet, uh, but you can expect that in the future. Uh, confirming to you that uh, that certainly we had no difficulties uh, in 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 a completed the audit. Uh, certainly this virtual environment. Uh, you know when when we, when, uh, when all this started back last year, we always talked about. How in the world do you complete an audit in the world that we live in? Well, like most businesses, we found a way, and and so we did conduct a virtual audit, and uh, in, in dealing with with with, uh, with with the with the with staff and Joe and and Pilar and and uh, and just 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 everybody. They've been really great in trying to in that, trying to get us information we need. Um, also, again, just acknowledging that there were no disagreements with management during the course of the audit. Certainly in any audit, there are discussions about certain accounting topics that maybe one may have a different opinion on, but that unto itself does not uh, rise to the level of a disagreement. Again, we've always enjoyed working with with, with uh, you all staff. I will say that you know, we did have an exit meeting with them uh, last week, and, 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 I'll, and I will confirm to you that you know certainly the impression they, they left me is an appreciation on, on their part that one, uh, you know, being a public entity, uh, you have 
a high level of, of integrity and responsibility to the public uh, in, in the way things are accounted for and managed. And, and I hope you as a board take pride in that uh, because certainly we took pride in that as you all, as you all being a client and, uh, and the feelings that they left us with in terms of their, their, uh, their responsibilities to the, to the organization. So again, I want to thank them for that. Uh, other than that, we really didn't have any other findings uh, or issues. Um, certainly during, during the exit conference, we, we did have some, what I would consider minor uh, uh, re recommendations that were the results of the audit, but nothing that rose to the level that it would be required to put in writing. Um, and so if nobody has any questions on just that aspect, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let uh, Luis speak to, to the financial statements themselves. Uh, Lise, you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman, members of the board. Uh, the first thing I'll go over is the audit report letter, uh, which you, I believe you should be seeing on your screen. Uh, if you don't have a report in front of you, and I'll just jump jump right down to the, the very last paragraph in that letter, which is our audit That's opinion. Our opinion. In our opinion, the financial statements uh, referred to above uh, present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the authority as of uh, December 31st, 2020. Basically, that is an unmodified opinion. That's a clean opinion. Uh, and it basically just, it, some, people, uh, some people get confused as to what an audit opinion is. Uh, an audit opinion does not speak to the financial health of any organization. It just speaks to the fact that, that the financial statements are not materially misstated. Uh, and you can re uh, rely on, on those. Uh, as Ricky mentioned on the next page, it does make reference to to uh, the government auditing standards audit report letter. Uh, that is included in the back of the report. I won't be going over that letter, uh, but just making you aware that it is there. Had we had any uh, findings that rose to the level of of uh, of required to be in writing, uh, those would be included uh, within that audit report and listed in the back of the report. So we, we did not have uh, any findings. Uh, the next thing I want to go uh, jump over to page 13. This is the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position. Just a, a broad uh, overall comment. Uh, if you think of the activity that, that uh, the authority had in 2020 as compared to 2019, uh, it, there really wasn't much of a, of a difference other than the issuance of the 2020 uh, bond series. Everything else uh, pretty much fell in line with, 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 with the way the prior year was, and th that's reflected on this statement. Uh, Operating revenues were within 1% of, of what they were last year. Operating income was also about uh, within 1% as well. So from an operating standpoint, everything was pretty, pretty much right in line uh, uh, with last year. Uh, the, the change in net position, which is the third line from the bottom, uh, this is basically your net income or loss. So your your net position increased by 2.3 million uh, this year. Uh, last year it increased by 1.2. Uh, the only difference here is that last year you may remember uh, some right away was conveyed over to to TexDOT, uh, and th that decreased uh, the authority's net position. But uh, again, from a broad overview, uh, from a broad perspective. Uh, everything was pretty much in line and, and consistent with with the with uh, the prior year and how operations uh, were in the prior year. Uh, if we can go back to page twelve, the previous page uh, before that. Again, here pretty much again right in line with with uh, where we were were last year. This being the, the statement of net position, the balance sheet, if you will, here you'll see the main activity that was different as compared to the prior year, which which was uh, here you, you'll see an increase in, in your long term debt, uh, reflecting the, the issuance of the 2020 A and B uh, series bonds. Uh, you also see an increase in your restricted investments, which 
uh, included in that are the proceeds from, from those uh, bond issuances, as well as deferred charges, uh, deferred outflows of resources, which were deferred charges on the refunding. That's basically the difference between the reacquisition price of the new debt and the carrying values of the old debt. Uh, other than that, uh, your unrestricted net position that pretty much again was in line uh, with what it was last year. You, we did see an increase of 750,000 as uh, in your unrestricted net position as compared to the prior year. Uh, but again, based on the, the nature of the organization, the majority of your net position uh, falls within the net investment uh, and capital assets. I won't be going uh, into the notes, uh, but like Ricky said, they are there. Uh, they do provide additional detail and additional information that support uh, the numbers uh, included in the face of the financial statement. So I do encourage you, uh, if you have time, to go through and, and read through the notes as they do as they do provide additional information. That's pretty much I have uh, my big overview. Uh, 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 big picture overview of the financial statements. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them at this time. Nope. Are there any issues that you felt uh, that we needed to address or weaknesses that you needed for us to address that are concerned to you? No, 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 David. Well, I mean, well, I'll, I'll take it, Luis. No, no. Uh, certainly, certainly not, nothing that rose to the level of of, uh, of needing to put something in writing. I think I think we, we may have had some couple of minor ones. I know that we discussed during uh, during our, our our exit conference, but nothing of any significance. One one of the things we did talk about, David, was just uh, you know we auditors tend to be historians, right? We we, we always live in the past, you know, just by, right. by the fact that this is December thirty first. Uh, but 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 the reality, you know, I think about you know, if I'm in senior y'all's position, the past is great. Okay, confirm the past. But w what about the future? One, one, one of the things we, we did talk about during our exit conference was, you know, what what are these financial statements going to start looking like, you know, three, four, and five years down the road, right? And and one one of the comments I made is, you know, as, as you are are capitalizing all these costs and in and and, and, and just using December 31st as an example. Uh, you all had, had had capitalized cost uh, to, to date of 128 million dollars, and if you were to assign just a 40-year life, let, let's say all projects stopped on that day, and and assign a 40-year life to them, you end up with depreciation depreciation about two million dollars a year. Well, right. if, if you look at December 31st as an example, you, you'd be barely breaking even or maybe negative, depending on the amount of, of associated depreciation. So then. So then we start talking about the expected revenue to be generated, you know, obviously from tolls, and that and that's kind of like the unknown. Uh, I did speak to to uh, to Pilar. He said he said, hey Ricky, you know, we are thinking that way, don't? And, and, and he confirmed that. You know, we we have projections of of, of what these financial statements will look like, specifically on on the revenue side, the toll side. If for no other res if for no other reason, you need to know that. In order to generate enough cash to to pay off the debt, right? I mean, people are not going to uh, continue to lend you money unless they they know they have sufficient cash flows coming in. So, so those, those are those are other type of discussions so that we are having that I, that I think hopefully add value to 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 the audit process rather than me just reporting on or us as a firm reporting on what happened in the past. And, and I hope yeah. that's something you'll acknowledge or appreciate. You know, Ricky, I think one of the things that we've we've noticed, right, has been the length of time it's finally taken for us to get these projects started, right? Right. And the toll project, the reason it's so important to us, it's that's reoccurring cash flow for the RMA. Correct. Right. Even though we've got the, the tax revenues there from the sales tax on automobiles, but at the end of the day, right, I think we've already paid the state you know, a significant amount of money. And what really worries me is, you know, we're responsible for maintaining the roads for us. That's the need for uh, the the uh, the toll right? right so i think you know both those things are going to help us in, in the long term but i think you know the rma is probably in really good position and really 
uh, we were finally notified today that we're going to get that funding that we need to complete that 365 project, which is really critical and essential for us to continue on our path and going forward, right? Right. And then we can move forward with IBTC. But I think as we go through this process, I mean, the, the, the state has caused us uh, significant delays, right? Unbeknownst to us, for really no reason for us, even despite COVID. Right. So I think we've actually had a very good audits, very clean audits uh, that I've been able to, to see. And I think that should give the state a lot of comfort in knowing that uh, we're running it correctly. So I, I think there's a lot of good things for, for Pilar and his team. No, I, 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 absolutely. Uh, uh, again, when, when we had a discussion about their acknowledgement, and I, I'll use a, a Pilot's term, and I'm, I'm sure it wasn't the per, very first time he, he's ever used it. He, you know, he, he, he said, hey, you know, we, we are in a fishbowl. We, we don't lose sight of the fact that, uh, you know, we have a duty and a responsibility to get these projects done and do it in a, in a financially stable way, if, if you will. And, and, certainly, and certainly to date, uh, as by evidence by the result of this audit and, and your audit, I think you, you, you all have done that. Um, but it's, it's one of those deals where, uh, as, as clients tell me from time to time, Hey, I appreciate what you did for me last year, but what have you done for me lately, right? And so it's right. it's always it's always talking about the now and the forward thinking, uh, rather rather, and just maybe acknowledging the past, but not not spending a whole lot of time there. But uh, yeah. well, but no, no, nonetheless, that that's that, that's the results of the audit, and uh, and uh, and I guess I I don't have any other comments unless you'll have any additional questions. I don't have any anybody have any additional questions, Frank. No, thank you. Okay. You good? Zeke? I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Okay, Paul, I don't know, is Paul on the line? Okay, thank you, Pilar. Uh, thank you very much for the okay. on, on the audit. Thank you, Luis, as well. Appreciate it. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for allowing us to continue to be of service. It's appreciated. Thanks so much. Yes, sir. Thank uh -huh. you. Thank you. Chairman and directors, the next item on your workshop is item number two, review of fiscal year 2020 annual compliance report for the Hidalgo County Mobility Authority. In your packet under uh, workshop item number two, there is a one page report. Uh, it's called the compliance report. We're required to submit it annually to Texas Administrative Code, Title 43, Part 1, uh, or Part I, Chapter 26, Subchapter G. Um, this will be a, an action item on your regular agenda to approve the report so that we can submit it uh, to TxDOT. The main component of this compliance report is the audit, the annual financial audit. So the, the board will have to um, uh, accept the audit and then uh, approve the compliance report so we can submit it to TxDOT. And that will be an a action items on your regular agenda. If there's any questions. Are there any questions? No. Okay, if not, can we move on to item number three? Yes, we have a presentation of construction performance strategies, the full engineering change proposals, uh, also known as VECP, and pre approved design alternative technical concepts, also known as ATCs and A plus B bidding. We have Sam Saldivar with uh, HDR Engineering, who is our general engineering consultant. He'll be uh, um, presenting uh, a portion of this, and then we have uh, Shankar with Southwest Valley Constructors will be presenting another portion of it, uh, and they'll be giving you a brief. They'll be giving the board a brief overview on these concepts. So, Sam, is on the line. Yes. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Ex excellent. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman and Directors. My name is uh, Samuel Saldivar. I'm with HDR Engineering. I do have with me Michael Maroney, who's uh, my uh, deputy uh, on, on uh, the GEC contract, but we're going to do some a uh, high level overview of the transportation project delivery options are available to the HRMA for their projects. And then in the latter part of the uh, presentation, we're going to go over what options are available to the to the 365 toll project. Uh, next slide, please. So the the different delivery methods that, that are available can be categorized under traditional or alternative delivery. Uh, the design bid build process is what the 365 toll is currently following, but maybe for some of the other HCRMA projects, there are all these, there are all the uh, alternative delivery methods such as the construction manager, general contractor method, design build, progressive design build, 
and integrated project delivery. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I'm not going to cover each each advantage and each risk. I'm just going to cover the highlights here. Uh, so under the design bid build process, this is where the owner contracts directly with the designer. They complete the design and then the owner contracts directly with the contractor to perform the construction. The advantages to this uh, process is that the industry is very familiar with this and it gives the owner an opportunity to uh, select a low bidder in this process. Uh, the risk main risk to this process is that the it's mostly owned by the owner because the owner is responsible for the quantities and, and setting the initial schedule. Next slide. The next method is construction manager general contractor. In this process, the owner contracts directly with the designer and also contracts with the construction manager general contractor at the same time. So the advantage to this process is the uh, it reduces the, the risk to the owner because the construction manager and general contractor have some buy-in to the quantities, you know, as the design is developed. The risk, though, is uh, that once you get to a certain uh, completion in the design process, the CM and general contractor will submit a, a price for the for the construction project. And if the owner feels like it's too high, then th they would have to go and convert to a design bid build process to get it to construction. Next slide. Uh, in design build, the owner contracts directly with one entity and that entity has the designer and the contractor on it. The owner also has the option if they don't have enough staff to contract with a program manager to help manage that design build contract. But the main advantages to this method is that it does reduce the owner's risk uh, and there's a single point of coordination for that design and construction. Uh, but the risk side of it is the owner gives up some of the control over that design. The designer does not work for the owner. The designer works for the contractor in this scenario. Next slide. So this is a uh, an, another version here, the progressive design build. This is actually very similar to the construction manager general contractor method. Um, the owner contracts directly with one entity, and that also has the design and the contractor in it. Uh, a lot of the advantages and risks are similar, but one of the things that's different between this and the CMGC method is that the owner is able to pull back some of that control over the design uh, in this method. Next slide. The integrated project delivery method. This is a, uh, a, a unique scenario where there's one contract that ties the, the owner, the designer, and the contractor all together. And in this single contract, uh, in this scenario, the risk is shared amongst all the parties. And because of that, the cost savings are also shared by all parties. The, the risk to this method, though, is, is if the project itself, if it doesn't have enough time in the project development schedule, and if there's not enough project complexity uh, in the project, then there's really not an opportunity for the team to find cost savings, thereby there's kind of lose the value of going through this method because uh, you're not able, not able to reap the benefits of, of what this method brings to the table. Next slide. <clears throat> but with that said, we're going to focus more on traditional delivery delivery for the rest of the project because um, that's what the 365 toll project is currently following. So let's take a look at some of these options available to to that project. Next slide. There's uh, there's three options that that we were looking at here. There's the value engineering change proposal or or VECP. There's also the alternative technical concepts, uh, the light version, so ATC light. And then there's also the incentives and disincentives options that are available uh, for the 365 toll. So ne next slide. We're going to dive a little deeper into each of these uh, three options. The first one being the VECP. Uh, we're going to go through the advantages, some of the risks, and then the opportunities of why it it is uh, it may be a match for the 365 toll project. <clears throat> so, um, starting with the advantages, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to find additional cost saving ideas uh, for the 365 toll project. 
uh, with minimal impact to the uh, to the procurement schedule. Uh, there's also uh, it puts the owner in the driver's seat to pick and choose what concepts that they're willing to entertain. Um, and this is actually a common process that's used elsewhere in the industry. Uh, Florida is one example of that, uh, except they call it their cost initiatives proposal. That's why you see CIP. The risk associated with this is that the, uh, you know, the industry here in Texas is not as familiar with this, um, but it, that's an easy hurdle to, to get over. Uh, the cost savings uh, could be limited uh, if, if there's not uh, ideas that are that are readily available or could be found, but we've already seen example that there can be ideas uh, found for this project. Um, and then this, the savings that are found, they're shared between the RMA and the contractor. And of course, the contractor contractor's cost is going to increase a bit because they're going to have to accommodate some redesign depending on depending on the options that they present to the to the RMA. Uh, now, moving to the opportunities, though, you know. It's just a good match for 365 toll because with with one contractor alone, they were able to find 16 VEC concepts uh, before. So if we open it up to the rest of the contractors, there's a chance for even more uh, ideas to come to the table beyond what's already been found. Uh, we would also have to make sure that we um, uh, vet the design. And and uh, you know again the RMA is in the in the owner seat for that, and determine that the cost savings are going to be worth uh, implementing these options. Next slide. Next one is the ATC light. Uh, the advantages for this is that again it puts the RMA just another way for them to be in the driver's seat to to approve or deny any ATCs submitted by the contractor. But uh, whatever ATCs are approved. They would be incorporated into the contractor's bid, which results in a firm cost commitment by the contractor. Similar risk to the uh, to the VECP is that the, the industry is not as familiar with the, the ATC light as far as it being uh, adapted to design bid build. Uh, but I, I again, I think there's that's a hurdle that's easily uh, mounted or you know we're able to get over. Um, now there would be a delay in the bidding process because. We need to accommodate uh, the time that the contractor needs to to bring on an engineer to to come up with the, with these design concepts, and we also need to afford the RMA uh, time for them to review it and evaluate it to to determine if they're going to accept it or or deny it. As far as the opportunities for matching with the 365 toll project, um, you know, it again this could yield additional cost savings. We've already seen through the VEC process that VECP process that. That there's some opportunities there that the contractors may come up with as far as cost saving ideas. Um, we would have to come up with a timeline with the RMA uh, to determine how that would impact the procurement uh, schedule. But whatever that impact may be, in the end, on the downstream side, you end up with a more cost effective contract uh, price. Next slide. <clears throat> The next one is the incentives and disincentives. This is a, a uh, an approach that has been utilized in Texas since the early 2000s by TxDOT. So the industry is familiar with it um, and it can be applied to the project in multiple ways. You know, there's an opportunity to introduce intermediate milestones. Uh, there could be milestones that cover the, the full length of the contract. There could be milestones that are applied to only certain certain construction components of the contract as well. So there's the, the RMA has options on how to implement the in, incentives and disincentives to the to the 365 toll project. The risk associated with this uh, with this option, though, is that the it has had mixed success of recent in Texas. Um, there has been some contractors that that have mitigated uh, the instant incentives and disincentives in a way to that uh, is, is in their advantage. Um, Another risk that's associated it if uh, if you're going to use a, a fund for an incentive, uh, you know you would have to make sure that you have enough funds within the budget that it's enough to incentivize the contractor themselves to to make it worth their while. <clears throat> as far as the opportunities for matching the 365 toll project, um, you know I think another important aspect that the contractor looks at is schedule savings. That's you know, we talk about schedule, but it does translate into 
cost savings to, to the contractor um, and, and es essentially to the overall contract itself. So um, there is an opportunity to speed up construction and and get tolling and uh, revenue up and running quicker. Um, it puts the contractor in the driver's seat. They're the ones that have the control. So as long as we give them enough incentive, they're going to they're going to look for for different ways, um, you know, to to build a better mousetrap and and expedite that construction schedule uh, so that they can realize those incentives. So that pretty much wraps up the options that we wanted to give a high level overview to. Um, at this point in time, you know, I'm, we're willing to entertain any questions that the, the board may have. Are there any questions? No, thank you. Okay, I have no questions. All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you. Chairman directors, uh, next uh, person up is uh, Shankar with Southwest Valley Constructors. Um, are you online? Yes, we're online. Okay, uh, well, you're, you're clear to proceed. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shankar Narayan and I'm with Kiwit. Actually, Southwest Valley is, uh, is a subsidiary of Kiwit. And I have here with me our, our area manager, uh, Steve Medina. And we're going to start our presentation, Steve. Good evening, uh, Chairman and uh, members of the board. Uh, I've got an agenda here this afternoon or this evening that I'd like to go ahead and uh, Shankar, if you could run the presentation, go to the next slide. Uh, we're going to want to cover, uh, obviously, the overview of the project and some of the things that Kiwit's done in the last uh, couple of months with regard to uh, the project itself, which I'll have Shankar cover. Uh, I'll cover uh, uh, the ATC process. I apologize if it's going to be a little bit redundant on what the presentation that you just uh, heard, but it's going to be a little different twist. Uh, certainly, uh, we sent over uh, one example of an ATC process that was done uh, with MoDOT, uh, uh, where it was a design or it was a design bid build process, uh, a project, and they utilized the ATC in the overall evaluation of the bidders, and I, we sent that over for you guys to read as an example. They don't see the screen this way. You're asking me to be the technical guy. You're out of you're out of your mind. I know. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Yes. It's even worse with Shankar, but he got it. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. So uh, again, that was just the first slide with the overview, and I'll have Shank cover that. Um, I'll talk about the ATC process as we know it and what we've used with a uh, actual bid build project. And uh, I sent you over the uh, MoDOT example. Uh, and then I also want to introduce a little bit with regard to uh, in that in conjunction with an ATC process, an A plus B uh, procurement method, you're over to one, you're, go back one, Shank, there you go. Uh, along with an ATC process, uh, bid build, adding an A plus B uh, procurement method that also is an advantage for the client for a scheduled component to a, to a project. Uh, so with that, uh, at the end, we'll uh, leave it up to some questions anybody might have. Uh, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Shank, and then I'll get into the, pres the rest of the presentation after he covers the uh, his section. All right, Shank, you're up. Okay. What we've done is we, we kind of reviewed all the uh, current design that the RMA has, which was done by Dan and Baum and some other local companies. And over here, the current design basically, you know, the project length is 13 miles. It's a four-lane divided highway. 15 bridges, there are, one is a 2,000 foot floodway bridge, and there's also an I road and Thomas bridge, which is steel structure, which almost has about 2.4 million pounds of steel. We also looked at it, there was approximately 4 million cubic yards of borrow, and the concrete pavements uh, section is a continuously reinforced section, which is a 13 inch CRCP on one inch HMA, with six inches CTB on 12 inches of lime tree. So what we did was we took the thing and then we flew the entire alignment with our drone. 
And after we did, did the flight, then we verified all the major uh, major qualities with the current design. Then what we did was we, we formed some task force meetings and we had discipline task force meetings and we started identifying areas for design optimization and cost reduction. So I'm just going to present you three slides here. You know, we got much more than this. I just want to, uh, because of time constraints. So one is we looked at the canal crossings, what we can do at the canal crossings. We also looked at the McCall intersection, the current design of the McCall intersection, and there is plenty of opportunity to improve that. Uh, the other thing we also looked at is what I said was that Thomas I Road intersection, which has the 2.4 2 million pounds of steel, and there is a lot of opportunity to change the design and re reduce all, most of the steel in that bridges. And the areas we looked at design optimization and cost savings was primarily we looked at the line and grade and see how we can reduce earthwork costs. We looked at potentially of flipping the stacking and minimize realigning some of the existing levy. There's a lot of realignment of existing levy we saw in the current design. We also looked at the typical sections of the pavement and also looked at the wall quantities and also look at opportunities to reduce all the MSC walls. On the bridges, we obviously uh, wanted to eliminate or minimize structural steel. We also wanted to optimize span lengths and minimize the canal bridge crossing. On the pavement design, we also looked at the optimizing the typical section and also looked at the possibility of a jointed paving as opposed to a continuously reinforced uh, concrete paving. And finally, we, one of the other th areas we said is um, to kind of expedite schedules, uh, we, we looked at you know, what is the possibility of the contractor manage acceptance testing, very similar to the process tech start users on design build. All right, Shane, good. So I really want to change to kind of cover a little bit of what we've done so far, uh, just looking at the alignment from a 10,000 foot elevation, but I wanted him to do that for a reason in the sense that uh, part of a contractor uh, through a process like this, it's really the innovation and the outside thinking that, that a contractor or a team has in looking at, at all possibility avenues to, to add value in a procurement process, whatever that might be, whether that's a design build, or in this case, it's a bit that's a design bid build with a twist, whether you want to call it ATC light or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the basic, uh, uh, as I sent over in MoDOT and having worked with Kiwit 35 years on many design build jobs, uh, the ATC process in itself allows the contractor, uh, whether it was a design build where you're teamed up with a designer or if you're now in a current uh, design bid build with an ATC twist to it, uh, it allows the contractor to really start thinking outside the box. And in doing so, that contractor does, in fact, take a look at any innovation that would be incorporated uh, into their bid. And that process is, is a well-thought-out process that, that, the, that the client uh, really lays out in a, in a guideline and a procedure that all contract has to have to follow. One of the things we start off with in our experience is, is whether you use a pre-qualified process, you want to make sure you're limiting the amount of t uh, contractors you're bringing to the table because as the last presenter uh, mentioned, it does take some time for the client in a ATC process to evaluate the, the number of ATCs that are submitted, uh, having one-on-ones with the contractors to, uh, to discuss and give a thumbs up uh, for them to advance that ATC and eventually incorporate it into, their, into, the, into the bid. So, uh, but the value out of that is in this, type, in this process as presented at MoDOT, the client gets the benefit at day one when the submit when they when all contractors submit the bid they get the lowest bid but they also get the best value and they've also had uh, collaboration during the bid process to look at every ATC ATC that's been submitted by the contractors and so everything's getting submitted has been pre-approved uh, together and everybody knows in advance what's getting uh, submitted into each contractor's uh, proposal so there's no surprises. Now, one of the things that you, uh, as I mentioned, in an ATC process, whether it's design build or if it's a design bid build like this one, you have to really make sure that, you're, that you have an ATC guideline that's clear direction to all bidders, as I presented this example again in, in the MoDOT example that we presented in, as part of this presentation and we gave the board uh, last week. 
Uh, one of the key things I mentioned earlier is having that ability for the client and the contractor during the bidding process to evaluate those ATCs, whether you limit it to three, five, one, whatever it is you limit it as a client per contractor, it's important that the one-on-one -on -one meetings happen uh, uh, for one, to, to evaluate the original or the con concept and give the thumbs up for the contractor to go ahead and uh, uh, allow them to move forward with that concept. Uh, and then after you move forward with that concept, uh, you, you then incorporate it into your, your bid. And as I mentioned, as in the guidelines and presented by MoDOT, uh, that's a very clear direction and a process that everybody knows and follows. Uh, one of the things in my experience that has to, that's crucial is during that ATC evaluation process that uh, you have to put an end to it. At some point, you say, okay, we're done. We've got all the process, all the ATCs are approved and give the contractor incorporate those ATCs into their bid and submit that, uh, their bid into the client. And uh, I've been on some procurement process where uh, if it's two weeks or less, it's very hard to incorporate those ATCs that, that uh, may or may not have been approved by the client. And, and so, but again, the, all those guidelines are set forth in a guideline to all bidders with regard to the process that's going to be followed. Uh, and before I go to the next slide, and I, and I go into schedule and, and those uh, type of advantages for the client, I just want to say that the alternative technical concepts is used by MoDOT uh, in the MoDOT project is, is it's really just one more tool in, in the client's toolbox to allow them to get the lowest bid at the bid type. Uh, unlike the uh, value engineering where you go in with the bid and then it's a 50-50 savings after the project is, is awarded, in this case, using this method, even with the bid build process, following it, following the guidelines, the client gets the advantage on at bid day by whoever ends up being low. There's no surprises on what ATCs got submitted. And Shank didn't mention it. One thing I did want to mention is that in all cases, all contractors into an ATC process has to be very, very conscious of the fact that the design, original design, uh, followed environmental processes and and there was reasons for where the, the, the right-of-ways are at and, and any of those things that went in with the original design. It's not the intent to go and redesign the process or the whole design project. It's the intent of this is where can we find ways to give the client the best value with the parameters, whether that be right-of-way or environmental, noise, and all the things that, they, that a, a contractor brings that has the experience in, this, in doing so provides to the client. Um, with that, I'll move on to the next one, which is schedule. One of the things within the ATC process and any process that allows the contractor to, to identify within their, their project or within the submittal of, of their bid a schedule component uh, one of the things that's really important is that, that you identify within your schedule those things that are going to reach substantial and substantial completion uh, to include any of the ATCs. Again, within the guidelines, it should be clear to the to the bidders uh, what that e what that means by substantial completion and final completion. Again, just a different component, but it should be addressed somehow within the uh, bidding procedures within uh, the project. Uh, the, the last thing I'll cover real quick and then I'll open up to questions is the A plus B bidding uh, process along with ATCs. And this just really within the procurement allows the client to in, uh, uh, make the contractors along with price, which is the A component. Okay, you have a bid of X amount, but the B component, which is made up of your LDs, which is liquidated damages times the number of days that that contractor is committing that bid time that it's going to take them to build the work. And what we like about A plus B bidding, it really forces the contractor at bid time to analyze that schedule, uh, understand what it's going to take to build the work. And the value of that uh, LD component is very important because the lower it is, the, the less value it adds to the client. The higher it is, it allows the, the client to have more teeth uh, within that commitment that each, client, each contractor is making to the schedule. Uh, and the A plus B along with ATCs gives, in this case, a very good uh, procurement process for this project. And we just wanted to give you guys another tool for your toolbox. We were asked by uh, Ramon to present what we know from uh, our experience at MoDOT. Uh, between Shank and I, we've got over 70 years of design build experience uh, 
having gone through probably every one of these procurement processes and just wanted to see if uh, we could uh, lend some assistance on what our experience has been and maybe answer some questions that the, the, the board or anybody might have with what we presented. Are there any questions from uh, any board members? Okay, Matt, uh, thank you for your presentation. You're very welcome. Okay, Pilar, this time uh, go ahead and make a motion to go into uh, during the workshop. And go ahead and go into. Is there anybody for public comment? Chairman, uh, we have somebody that submitted a written comment. I'm not sure if there's anybody on the line that would might like to make a comment. It appears, Chairman, that we have no one that uh, wants to make public comments. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and go into the report. Yes, sir. The next item on the agenda is item 1A, a report on program manager activity for the five tollway uh, project and the IBTC environmental clearance document. Eric Davila is going to give a very brief. Yes, sir. Good evening. On the screen, you should uh, see that same board, uh, that same presentation that is in the board packet. I'll uh, briefly fast forward to the 365 Toy project. Uh, essentially, with uh, the current schedule that uh, we're anticipating to keep, uh, we have, uh, I'm assuming, in March and in April reading of the uh, project development agreement, financial assistance agreement to fully program the uh, the project funding to the 365 Toy project. Uh, even if there's a, a slight uh, slight delay to that, uh, first and second reading, the schedule pretty much holds that by the end of this year. So you want to by essentially October, latest November, uh, we would be in construction. So everything's still holding on the schedule, and uh, we anticipate to go to release to advertise sometime in late May. Any questions on 365 Toy? No, sir. On the IBTC, uh, we have actually submitted the uh, a, a revised environmental assessment document. We responded to the a first round of comments. Uh, we're hoping that that uh, that affords us, uh, at least on the document side, uh, sufficient for processing um, concurrent from TxDOT. So they have essentially about another 22 days uh, to respond uh, on this latest submittal that we made. We, uh, based on our last meeting, also heard that we're about, about a month away from the design section on the schematic. Uh, when you approve an environmental document, you approve not just the reports and the, the summary report, which is the environmental assessment that we're currently in the final phases of review. Uh, you also submit the schematic, and that initial design essentially lays out the, the right of way footprint that has been cleared in the right of way document, in the environmental document. And the, the good news there is that once it, when both are approved, uh, you get your environmental clearance and can move directly into uh, right away uh, acquisition and coordination with uh, the owners. So we still have to the, the summer for a uh, public hearing, and uh, we've been answering a lot of a lot of public's uh, questions about when this is coming and when it's happening. Then we're just keeping them all on the same schedule that we put on this uh, PM report and keeping them all appraised. So questions on IBTC. No questions. Uh, anybody else have a question? Hearing none, that's all we have. Thank, Thank you. Camera directors, next item on uh, is item 1B is a report on 365 Tolling Project Financing. <laughs> Richard, I'm going to give you a uh, brief report. Uh, uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, board members. Uh, just a quick update. Uh, we uh, worked with TxDOT this past month, provided them all of the information they needed to um, be able to take action this month. Uh, I think it's delayed to next month, but that was internal. Uh, they had told us that everything that we gave them was, um, was fine and that's all they needed. Uh, following that, uh, so Eric talked about the schedule, so as long as we're on the same schedule, it should be okay. 
uh, for our financing around September. Um, we just as a matter of interest, we sold bonds today for Central Texas RMA, uh, approximately 510 million. It was very well received. We received about 10 billion in orders. Um, so I think the total investors are really interested for yield. And so as long as kind of rates hang in there, they've actually come down a bit. Um, it was done at a very attractive rate. I think the total for the combined deal was around 2.8%. They are um, rated higher uh, than we anticipate go, getting out of the gate. Uh, but um, I think all in all, it, you know, if we can keep this market, it's uh, probably, you know, in the mid three, somewhere around there for the um, for the RMA to execute their financing somewhere. So hopefully um, that's something we can accomplish in September. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Are there any questions? R Richard, uh, Richard, this is this is Forrest Runnels. Can you can hey, you describe? How are you? Uh, real real quick. Great. So, what is uh, what's our exposure in terms of time to locking down financing uh, relative to rates rising? Well, I mean, the exposure. You is say September. Really you you think we're we're we should be locked in and done by September? Is that what you're thinking? That's, you know, you can only lock this in once you sell bonds um, the day of pricing. Right. And, and so there's how just, soon do you think this? Go ahead. How, how soon do you think that that could, uh, how quick can that become a reality for us? Uh, I'm basing it on the schedule that uh, I'm working with the RMA staff based on procurement. So the biggest thing that we need is a contract uh, that we are firm with and so that means an execution of a contract as soon as that happens we have a few steps to do we have to go to the rating agencies and we have to do a, a week it's about a three to four week process once we have a contract in place uh, but that's the biggest hurdle is getting a contract in place otherwise we cannot sell bonds without having that yeah, I'm just, I like, I probably most of the rest of the board members are, are concerned as we just, this, this project continues to drag. And while that's not your fault, uh, rates are going to go up at some point soon, whether it's this year or within the next year. And you said here recently, we're what, 50 basis points away from this project moving away from us and, and us not being able to finance it? Uh I, I don't remember saying that. I mean, I, um, I've got my colleague. I thought for some reason we line. felt like sensitivity was like 50 basis points. No, we, we no. that just means we put a cushion on it, thinking that it brings rise that much. But I think they could go up probably higher. <clears throat> what do you think they could go up before we lose the ability to finance the project? Maybe that's something you can't answer right now. But Yeah, that's, that's hard to say uh, because it all depends on, you know, not just what rates are at the point, but how investors are feeling, the, the availability of credit. There's a lot of different dynamics that go into it. Uh, right. I just, I I, I'd like to say, I, would, I, I do think, Richard, not to interrupt, but I do think, and, I, and that's really all I had. We can talk offline, but I think if we're not careful, and this is just my opinion, and I've been involved, I've been involved with this project for many, many years at this point. And if we do not get this project financed sooner rather than later, it is and will, in my opinion, move away from us. And we can talk at length about that at some point other than on this phone call right now, but we are on the cusp of losing this project if we don't get it financed as soon as possible, that's my opinion. Forrest, I, uh, I agree with you. And, and I think, you know, I've done, I done a stretch a plus or minus 100 basis points. And I think it, at the 100 uh, basis points, our coverage does fall. So I agree with you, but I, you know, we did get some good news today from Austin. So hopefully that uh, we can get this thing resolved here quickly. Yeah, well, and I know this is, 
much of this is out of Richard's control, but I just, as, as a matter of stressing uh, where we are in this, uh, the process of this and trying to finance this project, uh, I like you, David, and the rest of the board, I, I just, I don't think you can stress enough to Richard and to all those involved, the sense of urgency to try to be prepared to move as quickly as possible for when we do get the go ahead and the green light from TxDOT, assuming we ever get it. I'm not sure why this has taken them as long as it has, but it continues to take them longer than it should, in my opinion. And if uh, if we're not prepared, it, there's, you know, the likelihood and the opportunity for it to move away from us, as you guys know, uh, is very likely. But Richard, I appreciate your help. Sorry, long-winded. I'll catch up with you here tomorrow offline. No problem. Any other comments, input? Okay. Uh, with that, uh, we would go to uh, uh, that consent agenda. Yes, sir. Uh, Chairman, directors, consent agenda. All matters listed under the consent agenda are considered to be written by the governing body and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items. Our discussion is desired that item or items will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Okay. If there are no questions, can I get a motion for the consent agenda? From Zeke. From Zeke. Second. Second. Somebody make a second. Yes. Second. Thank you, Joaquin. Second by Joaquin. All in favor say aye. All right. Aye. Same sign. Motion carries. Uh, regular agenda resolution 2021-04 resolution of fiscal 20 year financial statements and independence auto report for the Hidalgo County RMA. Chairman, directors, uh, you heard the presentation by Burton McCooper. Staff recommends approval of this item. Can I get a motion for approval of the uh, 2020 financial statement and independent auditors report? So moved, Frank. Motion by Frank. Can I get a second? Second. Second. Zeke. All the parents say aye. Aye. Paul saying Paul carries. <laughs> Resolution 2105, approval of fiscal year 2020 annual compliance report for the Dallas County RMA. Chairman, directors, with the uh, approval of the uh, the. Uh, Annual Financial Statement and Independence Auditors Report. Staff recommends approval of the compliance report. Uh, can I get a motion for approval of the compliance report? So move. Motion by Forrest. Can I get a second? Second, Zeke. All the pairs say aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, resolution 2021-08. Consideration of an approval of the First Amendment and restatement of the Professional Service Agreement for Engineering and Design Services for the Science, Oil, and Gas Services, LLC. Chairman, yeah. Chairman Directors, this item is for uh, consulting services dealing with the high pressure gas line utilities that we have to uh, relocate uh, throughout the project. Uh, this consultant provides us a very specialized service uh, dealing with high pressure gas lines. The majority of the work is, is um, to figure out ways to leave the gas lines in place and not to have to relocate them. Staff is recommending approval in the amount of, for work authorization number three in the amount of $2,940. Um, so we recommend approval. So moved. Second. I'm motion by four is mm -hmm. the second by Z. All the carries the aye. Aye. Uh, carries. Resolution 2021-09, approval of the Dow County RMA Authority 87 Legislative Program. Chairman, uh, in your packet, you have some proposed legislation, a uh, proposed bill uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, comprehensive development agreements for certain toll projects. Um, uh, this is something that we request every biannual from the, from the legislature to give us <laughs> CDA authority, um, and so staff is recommending approval of the legislative agenda. Uh, there are some bills that are currently being drafted that we'll, we'll bring to the um, to the board, uh, but we still have not received um, drafts of those to add, add to the approval for the legislative agenda. Well, Mark, can are I add one quick piece in here? Because yes. we do have some additional bills. Um, 
on the at the end of the resolution, perhaps a change in the language that would say the board hereby approves the 87th legislative program to promote additional transportation financing, including but not limited to Exhibit A, and that'll give staff and uh, Renee the flexibility to put cards in and to promote other bills that would increase financing for the projects. Subject to that change, can I get a motion for approval? Well, actually, it's it's with the change, right? I move yes, with, so with the amend amended as by Blake. Yes, yes. so move. Second. Deke, can I get a second. Second, my second. fourth. All in favor, aye. 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 Well, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Blakely. Uh, resolution 2021-10, consideration and approval of an interlocal agreement between the City of Mission and the Hidalgo County RMA to provide the right-of-way of acquisition services to the City of Mission. Chairman Director, in your, in your packet is a, a master interlocal agreement with the City of Mission to provide the right-of-way acquisition services as part of the Mission Madero International Border Crossing. Um, the City of Mission is entertaining uh, the possibility of a, of a rail component and uh, the, the authority has offered the ability to acquire that right away uh, to and through Hidalgo County um, and then possibly through adjacent counties, of course, with the uh, authorization of the authorities having jurisdiction in the adjacent counties. Um, staff, staff is recommending approval. Um, the um, city of Mission will be required to uh, complete the environmental approval process and of course, they would fund all acquisition services. And I believe we have the uh, city manager, uh, Mr. Randy Bettis from the city mission on the line if you, if you have any questions for him. Randy, uh, what does the interlocal agreement look like as far as the approval process for the Madero Bridge? Did y'all get that, that uh, bridge extended? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is Randy. Uh, we do have uh, uh, Mayor Ocaña on, on the uh, meeting as well. But yes, to answer your question, yes, it was extended. Uh, we did receive notice from the State Department. Um, and actually last night, uh, the, the mayor and the city council approved the environmental uh, studies, traffic studies, and feasibility studies. Great, congratulations. Are there any questions from many other members of the board? It, it, educate me here, Mr. Chair. The reason we're doing this is because we have the authority to proceed and the city doesn't. Yes, sir. Actually, we would they we would they would work through us. They would hire us to do uh, the work for them. For but, me. But, but they're going through us vicariously for because we have the authority. Yeah, that, that's correct. Okay. And yeah, and, and this is Forest and Condemnation Authority as well, I think, right, Pilar? Uh, that, yes, sir, that's correct. And so under under uh, Chapter 370 of the Transportation Code, we have the authority to acquire right away for mobility projects. Um, that could be a, a variety, but rail is one of them. And so that gives us the ability to, to acquire right away within Hidalgo County and outside of Hidalgo County with the permission of those counties outside our jurisdiction as long. And so this is why it's a master uh, interlocal agreement and it would require amendments from the adjacent uh, amendments and approval from the adjacent uh, authorities having jurisdictions, i.e. the county commissioner's courts to allow us to proceed into the adjacent counties to continue the right of way acquisition. But that's the way um, the statute uh, allows us to do that. Blakely, you see any legal consequences for us? Sorry, um, no, uh, we reviewed the agreement and made some changes and worked with the city of Mission on those uh, before bringing it to you. As Pilar said, as we move into other counties, we'll need to have approval of those jurisdictions and also tech stops. Um, but RMAs are very flexible in their ability to work with and support other governments. Do we have any type of indemnification agreement or anything like that with the city? Um, we'll be purchasing the right of way in the name of another governmental entity. It won't be in our name. And so okay. you know, we're just, we're, we're operating as almost a 
project manager is the way the agreement is structured. So we wouldn't carry any um, any of the liability for the purchase. The title company would carry that, right? And then uh, and, and we would move it into the project, however the project becomes designated. And, and the city is going to bear all the costs, Pilar? That is correct, Director. Pilar, this is Forrest. How about to terminate the agreement for if, if we chose to or if the city chose to? How would that work? Um, let me see the... Uh, or rather, Blakely, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the agreement is, is easily terminated, provided, you know, whatever cost we would incur up to termination uh, would be reimbursed. Um, it doesn't, you know, we work with a notice to proceed once we've got the authority from the adjacent counties to, to move forward. So, um, since it's just acquisition, there's not, you know, there's not any ongoing monthly fees or anything like that. Director, it's got a, there's a 30, 30 day out clause in the, in the agreement. Perfect. Thank you. You need a motion on that, Mr. Chair? Are there any other questions? You no. might not entertain a motion for approval. So moved by Zeke. Second, Second by Zeke. Second by Frank. Second by Frank. All those in favor say aye. 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 Sign. Motion carries. Chairman, we have Randy. Thank you, uh, Chairman and members of the board for your support. Chairman, we have a little business for the board's consideration. Okay, I uh, just want to kind of give everybody an update. We did uh, speak to the state today and uh, spoke to Chairman Bug and has advised us that hopefully the funding will happen here pretty quick for the 365 project in, in full. So uh, uh, not seeing the letter or document, and as soon as I do get it, I'll, I'll forward you guys a copy advising you of that fact so that we can proceed forward. Uh, that's all really I have any comments that I have. So thank you all for coming on the call today. If you have any questions, I'll entertain them at this point. We'll, we'll try to meet in person next next month. Yes, sir. We're scheduled to meet on the 27th of April in person. Okay. Is that okay with everybody? We'll, we'll, we'll get a yes. sure we social distance. And I think we can wear a mask, except we can take them off, I guess, just for the meeting. I guess that, that's okay. Yes, it, sir. May be, it may be better for some of us to wear a mask, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, director, right. director Dana, the staff has already kind of worked, sketched out a layout that we think will meet the six foot requirement. So I think we'll we'll make it work. Okay, if there are no other business, Zeke and his mask may have a motion to adjourn. <laughs> so move. <laughs> Thank you, Joaquin. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful week. See you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Safe. God bless. Thanks. Have a good evening.